thanks a lot pranav for this lengthy introduction uh, uh, so as uh, pranav said um, we met in kavli ipumi institute in japan when last year i was giving couple of talks one on india based neutrino observatory and another on neutrino oscillation uh, and then we became friends and he asked me why don't you come and talk about your journey in neutrino physics and share some excitements i hope i am audible am i audible or sh should i shout <laughs> okay so <clears throat> before i start uh, let me just ask a question so i need to operate from here right okay and yeah. do the uh, so let me see yeah they have a point it is a pointer yeah pointer is there okay fine so <clears throat> as per, uh, we start we are starting 15 minutes late so i assume that i will take 15 minutes more because i have many it things to <laughs> okay good so <clears throat> uh before i start uh, let me ask a question because i can see you know so many you know young faces uh, so how many of you have you heard about neutrinos you know in your journey just raise your hands okay and how many of you are from physics background like great so give me confidence that you know because i usually don't prefer to use big jargons but you see it's a high energy physics talk and i can't tell you everything in one and a half hours so i apologize in the beginning that you know i have to tell you the story but just take it as a story you don't need to understand everything but the take home message that let us try that in next one and a half hours in the morning if we can get excited about neutrinos and take home something by the time of lunch okay so as uh, pranav told me that you know you just talk about neutrino story so to me the most interesting thing that we have learned in last 100 years like you know there was a important question whether neutrinos are massive or they are massless and now we know from some experiments that they oscillate that means they have to be massive so that's why i chose the title massive neutrinos so what a big deal if neutrinos are massive it immediately opens a window for the physics beyond the standard model so let us try whether how these two things make sense okay so i am from institute of physics bhubaneswar you are most welcome to visit us and it is an autonomous institute under department of atomic energy we nurture basically physics research in various branches of physics and this is our social media handle so feel free to join us give your comments okay share your stories and we will be happy to listen to them okay so i need to go back here so there was a problem in 1914 the mission was to detect neutrinos so we know that this is the popular beta decay process when a neutron transform into proton and an electron and you can see niels bohr found that if this is the right process then energy is not conserved in beta decay because you can see if suppose you have a neutron sitting at rest so it has a rest mass energy around 1940 mev or so then it is decaying to a proton which is also almost at rest and you have an electron as a byproduct okay so now you can see the energy available in this process is the rest the difference between the rest mass energy of neutron minus the rest mass energy of the proton which is the q value of this reaction which is around some mev so you expect that this electron should emit with a monochromatic energy so this is our expectation all the neutrinos that will come up from this process should have a fixed energy okay and suppose you are lying somewhere here but when they did this experiment they found that this electron has a continuous range of energies starting from zero to this end point so then if it is a two body process then immediately you can see that the, your, if this is the right reaction then this red curve is violating the energy conservation okay so what is happening there because 
So far, we have not encountered any process where you know energy momentum is violated. You have to conserve them, like charge, electric charge. So then, Professor Pauli. So you can see there, you know, these two gentlemen, they are discussing something. And then in 1930, Professor Pauli came up with a remedy. So his suggestion was that let us write this reaction is in this form and assume that along with electron, so another neutral particle is coming out. Why neutral? Because you have not seen any other particle there. So it has to be neutral. If it is charged, then you will see in your detector, right? There is a neutral particle able to cross all detectors without leaving any trace and carrying all the missing energies. Means whatever energy is available, this is the difference between the rest mass of neutron and proton, will be shared by two guys. You know, sometimes neutrinos will take more energy, electron will less, sometimes electron will more, neutrino is less. So there will be distribution, not a single energy of the electron, OK? And he, he regretted at that time, said that, you know, I have done a terrible thing, OK? And I have postulated a particle just to save the sacred energy momentum conservation. And that cannot be detected, OK? So he wrote a letter to the, he could not attend a conference. And he wrote a letter to the radioactive gentleman, ladies and gentlemen, that, look, I have a ball dance party to attend better. So I'm not coming, but I am postulating this. OK? So fortunately, Pauli was wrong. And this is the story I am going to share with you. And neutrinos have been detected successfully. So in 1934, Fermi came into the picture, and he named this new particle as neutrino. So this is the way neutrino came into the picture. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah, so you see here, spinning top. So basically, the spin concept. Great. So neutrinos came into the picture in 1930, thanks to Pauli. And then Fermi named it as a neutrino in 1934. So if you look around, neutrinos are everywhere. And you can classify the sources of neutrinos in two categories. One is the natural sources, which are coming for free. And another is artificial sources. You create neutrinos in lab. Okay? So as far as natural sources are concerned, the main, one of the main source of neutrinos are sun. I will discuss that sun not only shine in light, but also in neutrinos. because there are thermonuclear fusion processes are happening. I will come to that. But from sun, we have solar neutrinos, mainly electron type neutrino. And their energies are in the MeV range. And they got detected in 1960. Very nice. Then we have these neutrinos from our atmosphere. So you have these primary cosmic ray particles, which are protons. And they interact with the air shower. And then they create lots of mesons. Mesons means pions or kion. And they are high energetic, energetic pions. And when they travel, they can decay farther. And they create neutrinos. So you see around us, we have the atmosphere. And we have these atmospheric neutrinos. And their energy is in a big range. You know, It lies in a big range from some MeV to few hundreds of GeV, OK? Not like you know solar neutrinos, which is spanning in a small range in MeV range. So you have these atmospheric neutrinos. So suppose you put a detector in Biambila Science Center here, then you can expect that your atmospheric neutrinos come from all possible direction, from top and as well as from bottom, because you have the atmosphere at the other side of the Earth, and neutrinos can penetrate anything. So you are getting neutrinos from all possible directions. Good. Then at the core of our Earth, there are radioactive elements, which are heavy elements. And when they decay to make it stable, in that decay chain, you have also produced 
electron antineutrino from beta decay from the earth crust, which we call geoneutrinos. And it is not a very old story. In 2005, for the first time, this Kamland experiment in Japan, they first announced that we have detected these geoneutrinos, which are coming from the center of the Earth, from the core of the Earth. OK? So this is then at the very beginning of the universe, at, at Big Bang, from Big Bang, we also have these relic neutrinos, which are very low in energy. And this is the number. There are 330 neutrinos per centimeter cube for three different flavors, if you sum them up. And we have indirect evidence. We have not detected them yet, because they are very low in energy. And then comes neutrinos from supernovae. We all know in 1987, from supernova explosion, we detected those neutrinos. And those neutrinos can come from the very core of the supernova. You know that light can't come because light will be obstructed because neutrino, but neutrinos can come. So this is the supernova neutrinos, and their energies are also in the same range of like solar neutrinos, but it has that little bit larger energy range. And you can have both nu e, nu mu, nu tau kind of uh, nu, uh, both electron and muon type neutrinos from supernovae. So, and now another interesting story is unfolding here is the ultra high energy cosmic ray neutrinos. So you are all familiar with large hadron collider, where two protons are, you know, you are mashing two protons. And we have reached a center of mass energy of 14 TeV, OK? So suppose, you know, we are all familiar with electron. And what is the mass of electron in energy unit is half a MeV. So you compare with that, you know, GeV is 10 to the power 3, TeV is another 10 to the power 3. So we have around 14 TeV, we have achieved that energy. But there are ultra high energy astrophysical sources like active galactic nu nuclei or gamma ray burst. And from those sources, you can have high energy astrophysical neutrinos, and their energies can be TeV, PeV, EV order. And in the South Pole, there is a, this fantastic experiment called Ice Cube. What we have done, we have just dig the ice of one kilometer cube area. So you have length, breadth, and height of one kilometer cube ice in South Pole. And you have dig the ice, and you have put the photomultiplier tubes at certain distances. And this is your detector. So this is the ice cube detector. And in 2013, they announced that they have started seeing events which are coming from these astrophysical sources. They don't know the nature of the sources. Just now, they have revealed one events. But they are sure that these are not atmospheric neutrino events. They are ultra-high energy astrophysical neutrino events. So, so far, in seven and a half years, they have seen more than 100 events. And it is a, you know, I'm, I feel fascinated when I see the way ice cube planned because they understood that to see neutrinos, which are very weakly interacting, you need a massive detector. Because you know it interacts with the nucleons. And if you have more and more nucleons, the chances of getting events increases. So they just took, let's go to South Pole, use the whole ice over there. Okay? And now they are extending it. You know? You know, so Ice Cube version 2, upgrade. So this is as far as the natural sources. But then, you know, our quest never ends. So to learn more about neutrinos, we have also started making accelerators in Fermi Lab in the US, in CERN, in Rutherford Lab, in J Park in Japan. You have accelerators, and you create neutrinos from accelerators. And you follow exactly the same process that nature has followed to give you atmospheric neutrinos. So what they do, they take proton beams, and they have a target, high Z target. They smash the target with proton beams, and then they produce pions. And these pions decay, like in atmosphere, and you have neutrinos. But these are man-made neutrinos. You can control their energy, okay, the, lumino the flux of the neutrinos. So muon neutrino got discovered in particle accelerators, I will talk about. Then when you get electricity here, you have these fission processes of, in the radioactive chain. And as a byproduct, you have also electron antineutrinos there. 
So you have reactor neutrinos, rather anti-neutrinos, and in accelerators you have both neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. So I have exhausted all the sources. Now let's see what we have learned from these sources. So good thing about neutrinos, when you see, the, see these are the pictures of various neutrinos. These are the relic neutrinos from Big Bang, solar neutrinos, geoneutrinos, reactor neutrinos, supernovae, accelerator, atmospheric, and then astrophysical cosmogenic neutrinos. And if you see their energies, you know, the way I have placed it, so here, this is the x-axis is the range of the neutrino energies coming from different sources. You see, when you see this range in the x-axis, it spans 23 orders of magnitude. That means if you study neutrinos from various sources, you will probe their properties not at a particular energy, but the energies range between 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the 19 electron volt, 23 orders of magnitude. So it is important when you say, okay, neutrino has this property, it is important that we falsify this statement at different energies because in high energy physics we know that things may change with energy, you know. There are some fundamental parameters, they run with energy. They take different values. So it is a legitimate question to ask how neutrino properties get changed at different energies. So when you have the sources available around this large range of energy, this gives you a handle to study neutrino properties along this wide range. Now what is plotted in the y-axis? This is neutrino, electron, anti-neutrino electron cross-section. So, this is the probability that suppose if you have an electron antineutrino from your power reactor, and suppose you have a tank, water tank here, you have electron, proton, neutron in the tank. You take any matter, ordinary matter, you have electron, proton, neutron, whether it is a scintillator, argon, or iron, or water. So these neutrinos will come and interact because you don't see neutrinos. You see they are charged cousins. If you have an electron neutrino, it will give you electron. If you have muon neutrino, it will give you a muon. And if you have a tau neutrino, it will give you tau. And that's why you conclude that these neutrinos have come. So this is the cross-section. That means the area available for the collision or the interaction. Now just to give you an idea, suppose if you have a 1 GeV neutrino, then the area available for the cross-section is 10 to the power minus 40. So number one, take home message. You should remember this number. That typical neutrino cross-section is 10 to the power minus 40 centimeters squared. Try to write down those zeros. Now let's compare how weak or large. Go to LAC, where protons are colliding, and you have strong interaction, right? So let's compare strong with a neutrino, which is weak. So if I want to estimate cross-section for proton-proton collision, that means the area available, right? So think like proton is a circle. So what is the area? Pi r square. Sabko pata hai. Huh? So what is the radius of a proton? OK, board is over there. So just move kar lete. So proton radius is 10 to the power minus 15 meter. So pi is 3.14 something. R is 10 to the minus 15 square. If I do that simple calculation, I get an area 10 to the power minus 26 centimeter square. So this is the area available when two protons collide with strong interaction. And this is the cross section at 1 GeV neutrino 10 minus 40. So this is the strongest message I want to give. The strength of the weak interaction is almost 14 orders of magnitude smaller. And that makes your life difficult. And that's why Pauli wrote, probably you will not be able to detect. But human imagination co can go any, any, anywhere, and ultimately you have been able to detect. But 
it took like 50 years, okay, to establish the neutrino detection. So is it clear? That we are dealing with guys who don't want to talk to you. Okay, great. Let's move ahead. So these are the energy spectrum of neutrinos from various sources I just talked about like solar neutrinos, relic neutrinos, supernovae, atmospheric, and then this astrophysical, high energy astrophysical neutrinos. Since you guys are attending astronomy school, I thought it is better to have this slide. So how neutrino works or helps in astronomy? So when you think about these sources, like your sun, or like your atmosphere, or your earth core, do you think that we can go at the center of the earth? No. But neutrinos are coming from the center of the earth to you without getting deflected because the interaction is very weak. So if you can study those neutrinos, at some point if you accumulate a large number of events, you can do a 3D tomography like MRI brain scanning of your earth. This is called the neutrino tomography of earth, a very hot topic of research. You can use neutrinos to learn about your earth. You know, if you, from helioseismological studies, okay, from, you know, earthquake, we have an understanding about earth, but there is an error of around 5 to 10 percent, okay? And we don't know the exact boundaries, like where the crust ends, where the mantle ends, where the core starts, then there's an inner and outer core. But if really we can study those geoneutrinos, or if you send beams, like, I know I'm sitting in India-based neutrino observatory in south, and let's say send someone a beam from CERN, so it will pass through Earth, and it will just see the Earth. And it will come to you and tell me, hey man, you know, I have seen this is the way Earth looks. So you do neutrino tomography, the Earth tomography with neutrinos, a very hot topic of research. Great? So when they come to you, they are not deflected. Like you think about supernovae, or think about sun. So when sun, uh, neutrinos come from sun, it is just eight minutes away because you know this is the time neutrinos take to come to you from sun. But when you see a light, it is like few millions years ago this photon has emitted, and then it is coming to you, and mostly from the surface of the sun, because if from the core light will come, photon will be trapped inside the medium of the sun. But neutrinos, they come from the core of the sun itself, and it is just eight minutes far apart, okay, and they are reaching to you. And they are bringing information about the processes which are happening inside the sun. So that's why I wrote, they are not deflected by the magnetic field, interstellar magnetic field. So point back to their source. They rear rarely interact with matter, as I told you. So they arrive directly from the regions where light cannot come, clear? Neutrinos carry information about the workings of highest energy, like this astrophysical neutrinos, and they are from not our galaxy, even farthest of galaxies, so from vast distances. So this is the era of neutrino astronomy in which we are living in. Neutrinos can point back to their sources. Is it clear? Okay, so how useful can be a neutrino? Just to give an idea, when we have seen these solar neutrinos, by seeing solar neutrinos in Super Kamiokande, we can measure the temperature at the core of the sun with a precision of 1%. It's a half an hour calculation if I just use a board, but I can convince you guys that you can measure what is the temperature at the core of the sun. Isn't it fascinating? with a precision of 1%, we using neutrinos, okay? So, you know, we are living in a very exciting era of neutrino astronomy. Few quick important things. So I told you after photon, neutrino is the second most abundant particle. So we have like a cosmic microwave background, a photon bath, and its temperature is around 2.7 Kelvin. Like that, we have also a cosmic neutrino bath and its temperature is around 2 Kelvin or so. And these are known as these relic neutrinos, I told you. 
And these are so low in energy that we don't know how to detect them. We don't have any mechanism right now. But people are working on that. If you think about neutrinos, how weakly they are, this is the number. You know, I wrote this number just to strike your mind that how many zeros are there. OK, take a look. Don't hurry. Sun produces this many neutrinos. So sun is a copious source of electron neutrino, 10 to the power 38. But most of the neutrinos we see around are the relic neutrinos from Big Bang. And they are 10 to the power 10 years old. So just few numbers. How elusive the neutrino? If you take 100 billion neutrinos and take not a small detector, take the whole Earth as a detector you have only one interaction. OK? Another thing, what is the mean free path now of neutrino? So you do know what is mean free path? You are going to the crowd, you are going to the crowd, what is the chances that you will collide with other guys? And the distance trouble between two collisions is the mean free path. So if I take lead, the typical mean free path of alpha, beta, and gamma rays are 50 centimeters. But if I talk about the solar neutrinos, the mean free path is light years. OK? Inlet. What is light years? Light travels in one year. That is the distance. Inlet. OK? So this is the mean free path. So again, you can just calculate this from that cross-section principle. You see? They don't talk. They don't react. OK? So good bring information from the farthest source. And you know why neutrinos are very important in standard model of particle physics. We know neutrinos are massive from oscillation. I will talk about. But we know the mass should be like million times lighter than electron. So electron is half a MeV. But the neutrino mass, the mass, sum of the three neutrino mass can be only half a electron volt. Question comes, who ordered that? Why neutrinos are so less in mass? We don't have any guiding principle. Why six orders of desert over there? Some is in MeV electron. Then all of a sudden, all the neutrinos are in half a EV. OK? So those questions we need to address. Again, we took morning work in the, you know, so when you are taking a morning walk, again, these numbers, you know, because you know, it is just a fun. We will remember these numbers. This many billion neutrinos are coming from the sun at the Earth. 10 to the power 30 is the which are emitting. But how many are coming to you? This many, when you are walking in the morning. 50 billion from all the natural radioactivity that you have, this natural radioactive element in the Earth core. And 10 to 100 billion neutrinos from all the power plant. The power plants you have in Japan, China, Kodai Kulam, everywhere. They're all creating neutrinos, but coming to you. So you can still enjoy your work. They will not harm you. Typically, a neutrino has to jiff through this many people before they do anything. So again, same thing, that you know they will just pass through your body without talking to you. And in fact, our body contains 40K potassium. And this is a radioactive element. And 20 milligrams of 40K. And it emits 350, uh, 40 million neutrinos per day. So we are all our neutrino sources. We are all emitting neutrinos here. OK, just put a detector, man. <laughs> OK, cool. So this is this light electron positron experiment in CERN, which happened around 1990. From that experiment, we got to know that there are three different type of flavor of neutrinos, nu e, nu mu, nu tau. It is important to know why three. Why not four, five, or one? So this experiment, so in LEP experiment, like in LAC, you have a collision of proton and proton. In LEP, they had a collision of electron and positron. So this is called light electron positron collider. And from that process, 
when E plus E minus collide, you create this Z boson, like Higgs boson, but Z boson is the mediator of weak interaction. Higgs is responsible for mass, but Z boson is responsible for weak interaction, the neutral boson. You create Z, and it has a short lifetime. So it will decay to many things. Also neutrino, anti-neutrino pair. Suppose Z is decaying to electron-positron pair, mu plus, mu minus pair, they are all charged. So you can see them in your detector. But then, when they are decaying to neutrinos, you can't see them. So that is called invisible decay width. Okay? And from that measurement, we precisely know that there are three light active flavor neutrinos. Nu E, Nu Mu, Nu Tau. And this number is very precise. I told you, neutrinos are neutral. So you don't see like electron or positron. You put a magnetic field, you see electrons. But if you put a magnetic field and if you have a neutrinos, they are neutral, then do, do, don't do anything, they will just pass through. But when a new E comes, it produces electron by hitting with the target. And this target can be your electron, can be proton, can be neutron. If a new mu comes, you have a muon. And you have a new tau comes, you have a tau. This is a second take home message. We don't see neutrinos directly. Never. We see their charged cousins through weak processes. Clear? So in Super Kamiokande in Japan, when a solar neutrino is coming, you have an electron in the water, and then you have an outgoing electron, so they measure the recoil of the electron through a Cherenkov light. So that is what the way super case is solar neutrinos, for an example. Okay? If I talk about antiparticle, you have electron antineutrino, muon antineutrino, tau antineutrino. So if you have a new E bar, you will have positron. If you have a new mu bar, you have a mu plus. If you have a new tau bar, you have a tau plus. The antiparticle. Good. So, I talked about three neutrinos. Now let's just spend a couple of minutes about their discovery, the detection. So first we detected electron antineutrinos in Savannah reactors. This is the famous process. A Nobel Prize was added, awarded to Frederick Renz in 1995. Then comes muon neutrino in particle accelerators. We discovered that from pion decay. And from this decay, we always see a muon but never see an electron. So we confirmed that there's a second type of neutrino exist which is muon neutrino, and these three gentlemen so were awarded Nobel Prize. So just start counting Nobel Prizes, okay? Number one, number two, and then just in 2000, so 20 years purana kahani hai. In Fermi lab in Batavia, okay, we discovered the tau type neutrino. In 1975, when tau, tau ones were discovered, like electron, muon, tau on, People got to know that there should be a new tau. Just look for it. But first time in 2000, there was an experiment called Donut, and they discovered the third type. Okay, lack of time, I will no go, not go into details. This is the famous Super Cameo Khande. You know, whenever I utter this name, my goosebumps, you know, I feel my goosebumps because I was there and I can see. So. This is like a tank of water, and this is the dimension of the tank. So just koshish karo, is ghar ka dimension kya hai, aur ye tank kitna bada hai. Okay, so just look at these numbers. So it's a cylindrical stainless steel tank, not a big deal, but it contains on the surrounding this many photomultiplier tubes. They were created or produced by Hamamatsu, the famous company in Japan. So this company came into the picture because of this. And now they are supplying photomultiplier tubes to all the neutrino experiments all over the world. 
So I told you, when you have a, such amount of water, how much water is there? 50 kiloton. In that tank, you have 50 kiloton water. But only they consider reactions in, uh, of 22.5 kiloton, kiloton, which is inside the vessel, basically. So the outside part, if there are some reactions happening, they don't count it, because there can be background. So they just use for their experiment the inner part of the water, which is like half of 50 kiloton, 22.5 kiloton. And this is called fiducial volume. Okay, the volume which you use for experiment. Okay? So this is the tank, and these are the photomultiplier tubes. And they have these robots, you know, because these photomultiplier tubes can go bad. This water can be contaminated, there can be leak. So last summer, they just changed the water, some part of this, okay, in summer. So you see there are two people on the boat, literally, inside the tank, fixing those photomultiplier tubes. So it's amazing, no? If we can see this ourselves. So the message that Super K gives, build very large detectors and wait for a very long time, where will it So I told you that, you know, typical 10 to the power 25 neutrinos are passing through this detector every day. But only they see 5 to 10 events. Okay, these are solar neutrinos I'm talking about. But they also see atmospheric neutrinos. But how they distinguish, by the way? So, suppose abhi tum bahar jao, sun tumhe dikhe gao, there is sun. So it's a point source to you. So when an event happens in your detector, suppose you have the tank here, from the direction of the event, you know, if you point back, that these are from sun. And these are MeV neutrinos. But atmosphere, charo taraf hai. So those events will come from all the directions. So if your detect detector can tell you the direction of the event, then you can know what is the source. Okay? And also energy, because solar neutrinos are confined in MeV range. Atmospheric, MeV to hundreds of GeV. So energy, measuring the energy of the events and the direction is very important to tell Okay, I have seen solar neutrinos. I have seen atmospheric neutrinos. Okay, so this is just an example, okay? Great. So, in super Kamiokande, when you have a muon from a new mu, because in atmosphere you have mostly muon type neutrino. And in sun, sun you have electron type neutrino. So you know that when a charged particle moves through a medium, and if its group velocity, is larger than the phase velocity of light in that medium, then it emits Cherenkov radiation. Okay? And this is the Cherenkov light coming from those particles when they move inside the water. So the beyond ring, the Cherenkov ring, is very sharp. Can you see this ring is very sharp? And the electron ring, because electron loses energy very fast, okay? due to PR production and brain star long. So this ring is very fuzzy. So from this neat ring and a fuzzy ring, super K can identify whether it is a muon neutrino or whether it is a electron neutrino. So this is called particle identification. It is very important, right? Your detector can't see neutrinos. They see electron or muon. But this is the way the signal differs. And what are these colors? These colors denotes the arrival time okay, of the event. So let me proceed. So how I'm doing with time? Okay, good. So if I so this was my discussion about neutrino source and detection. Okay? Now let's move into some more detailed physics. So when we talk about neutrinos, there are three most important questions that bothered us in last 100 years. In around 1930, first question people asked, how tiny is the neutrino mass? And now, the most precise measurement is this. Some of these three neutrinos mass can be maximum 0.2 electron volt. 
मैंने हाफ आई एम ई वी कहा था सो यू नो जस्ट अराउंड दैट एंड हाउ यू नो दिस नंबर फ्रॉम कॉस्मोलॉजिकल ऑब्जर्वेशन फ्रॉम प्लैंक सैटेलाइट फ्रॉम बैरियन एकोस्टिक ऑसिलेशन डेटा फ्रॉम डब्लू मैप डेटा सो दीज आर ऑल कॉस्मोलॉजिकल ऑब्जर्वेशन देर आर सैटेलाइट ओवर देयर एंड दे सी द सी एम बी द सी एम बी आर कॉस्मिक माइक्रो फोटोन बैकग्राउंड ऑल्सो दे आर सेंसिटिव टू कॉस्मिक न्यूट्रीनो बैकग्राउंड एंड फ्रॉम दैट we have the information about this mass and this is upper limit what is upper limit means the sun cannot be bigger than that but it can be lower than that so take home message number 3 neutrino mass bahut chota hai kyun a million dollar cost question okay we have some idea but we don't know exactly what is the reason we can work on that second question neutrinos are neutral so you may ask this question that if it is a neutral then can neutrino be its own anti particle if it is a neutral particle it is not like mu plus mu minus or e plus e minus it is neutral so can they be same to answer this question people are performing an experiment called neutrino less double beta decay there are more than 15 experiments are now taking data all over the world what is this process so there are some nucleus with atomic number z mass number a and they can transform in this way where atomic number gets increased by 2 units so you can see already the lepton number is violated by two unit so neutrino less means from this transformation no neutrinos are coming like double beta decay matlab do beta decay ho raha hai and this neutrinos from two beta decay they annihilate each other and it's called neutrino less double beta decay we have not seen a signature of this process but if we see any trace of this process we can conclude that neutrinos are only they are on on anti particle and it will remain and require lepton number violation and it will also tell you that neutrinos are majorana particle so another important fundamental question in neutrino physics is whether neutrinos are dirac or majorana type particle we know that the spin half fermions they are all dirac particles right but for neutrino this is also a fermion spin half particle but since neutrinos can be its own anti particle so the question come whether neutrino and anti neutrino are two different entities or they are same if they are different then they are like usual dirac particle but if they are same then we can call them they are majorana particle this question was asked by professor majorana around the same time and we still don't have an answer but it's a very fundamental question third question i told you there are three flavors of neutrinos now if i create a neutrino of certain flavor and now i allow these neutrinos to travel in space and time then you can ask a question do neutrino flavors oscillate in one another suppose i start with a flavor electron type neutrino and you have put a detector there and source is here so and you are allowing neutrino to travel is there a probability that in your detector you will see a different flavor if you start with a electron flavor can you see a muon flavor or some of the electron neutrinos will be lost and you will see a depletion in the number this is called oscillation neutrinos are transforming into different flavor these questions were asked by these gentlemen in 1960s and i am happy that rest of my talk i will tell you that we have a definite answer for this out of these three question we are sure we are confirmed that neutrinos do oscillate for this reason we can also conclude that neutrinos have mass and they mix what is this mixing i will explain for this 2015 nobel prize 
to Professor Takaki Kajita from Japan and Professor Arthur McDonald in Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada. Professor Kajita san was here in 2017. So we have answered the last question positively. Number four take home message. So we know that lepton flavor violation is indeed happening in nature. You start with a flavor electron, it transforms to muon. So flavor is violating. Okay, but not the number. They are all lepton, but the flavor is getting transformed. So I will talk about this flavor violation or neutrino oscillation in rest of my talk. So in particle physics, your life is all about experiments. Okay? Unfortunately, in my country, we are mostly theorists, and we think from theorist point of view. But I can tell you, you know, and I can tell you in any platform, that whatever we learn in high energy physics through experiments, you need to validate your theory, whatever cook up in your mind, you need a platform, you need an experiment. So when I say neutrino oscillates, who are the guys, who are the pioneering experiments? So I note them here. These are your solar neutrino experiments. I work for this guy, uh, this experiment, Borexino, in Italy, in Gran Sasso. So I work for this experiment also. But there are many other experiments. Some of them are over. Some of them are still taking data. These are reactor neutrinos, OK? I told you, you generate electricity. So these are all famous reactor anti-neutrino experiment, electron anti-neutrino experiment. And out of these, Dayabe in China, Reno in Korea, they are just going to finish. And all of them are over. These are atmospheric neutrino experiment. Super K still taking data for last 20 years. Ice Cube is taking data in South Pole. And the inner co 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 version of Ice Cube is known as Deep Core. This is also taking data. And for, I know hopefully in our India, the India-based neutrino observatory will be added here in this category because our goal is also to see atmospheric neutrinos which are coming for free. Their energy range is huge and they are coming from all possible direction. So this is the USP of our experiment, the India-based neutrino observatory. And these are your particle accelerator neutrinos. T2K in Japan and NOVA in Fermilab, they are now running. These are over. OK? And this T2K experiment, they sent a beam from J Park to the same super Kamiokan detector. So super Kamiokan is like a temple in Japan. OK? It is seeing solar neutrinos. It is seeing atmospheric neutrinos. And it is also seeing the beam neutrinos. OK? So they really treat it because they still think it is going to earn more Nobel Prizes. OK? So over the last two decades, from these experiments, you have seen this many neutrinos. But you see, when I say I have seen these neutrinos, these sources are widely different in nature. The neutrinos are coming with different energies. Their distances are also different. When you talk, think about sun, like kiloparsec distance. But when you talk about atmosphere, height of the atmosphere is 15 kilometers. And the diameter of the Earth, 12,000 kilometer, very less compared to the sun Earth distance, right? So just, you know, homework. Go and think about the sun and Earth distance. Ka kitna hai. OK, you will get an idea. So my point is, and when you think about reactor neutrinos, your detector is like one kilometer apart, or say 50 meter apart. So the question is, neutrinos are coming from all possible sources. They are widely different in nature. Their energies are different. Their path lengths are different. But they are all pointing towards one phenomena. What is that? Neutrinos oscillate. That is for sure, OK? So that's why it is not only one data or one experiment. You have plethora of data. They're all pointing towards the same phenomena. So I can conclude it's a very robust phenomena. It is established, OK? So neutrinos change their flavor as they move in space and time. So just a brief summary. If I think about the standard model of particle physics, 
how neutrinos look like. So I don't need to repeat. You have three flavor neutrinos, E, mu, and tau. They are neutral, spin half, and they only take part in weak interaction. And if they are massive, they can feel some gravity, but very weak. But another important milestone in our understanding of neutrinos is, from Goldhaver's experiment, that all the neutrinos are left-handed, and all the anti-neutrinos are right-handed. OK? So when you want to give mass to any particle in standard model, you need three things. You need the left-handed particle, you need its right-handed counterpart, and Higgs. So just like for electron, you can write down a mass term, m e shy e bar shy r shy r bar shy e. So you need this both left-handed and right-handed counterpart to give masses. But if think about neutrinos, so I told you that there is no right-handed neutrino. You have only left-handed neutrino. So for neutrinos, in the basic standard model, you cannot write this Dirac mass term. Because to write a mass term, I told you, and this left-handed, right-handed, you know, this depends on the momentum direction and the spin projection. If they are in the same direction, then it is right-handed. If it is opposite, then it is left-handed. So the summary take-home message in the basic standard model of particle physics, which we know now, we cannot write a mass term for neutrino. Our theory, the construction of standard model, one of the important ingredient when we write standard model, we assume that neutrinos are left-handed. And this is not an assumption. This is an observation in experiment. And all the anti-neutrinos are right-handed. So when you think of electron, suppose the electron beam is going, you know, moving, you have half of the electrons are left-handed, half of them are right-handed. But when you think of a neutrino beam, all the neutrinos there, all are left-handed. So you cannot write, your theory doesn't allow to write a mass term for neutrino. So neutrinos are massless. So your theory is telling that neutrinos are massless. But the 20 years of experiments I just talked about for last one hour, they are telling neutrinos oscillate. Think like pendulum. Koi oscillate karega to usko to mass hona hi hai. I'll come to the theory. So neutrinos are massive because they oscillate. So you can see a clear conflict between your theory and your data. That's why I call neutrino flavor change, which is I call oscillation, demands that neutrino should have non-zero mass. And these neutrinos should mix among each other. But theory doesn't allow you to write a mass term. So that's why this was my title of my talk, that non-zero neutrino mass is the first experimental proof for physics beyond the standard model. Whenever we say we need to go beyond standard model, what is the motivation? I can tell you the neutrino oscillation is the only lab-based particle physics motivation that forces you that we should think beyond our standard model because we need to incorporate neutrino mass. Standard model cannot explain dark matter, dark energies, but these are all cosmo observations. Only particle physics lab-based evidence is neutrino oscillation which tells you that there should be some new physics beyond the standard model, because you need to explain this mass of the neutrino. It is not a joke. So that's why, you know, neutrinos are so important for us, for all the particle physicists. The holy grail is now to write down that new standard model, quote and unquote, new standard model, which will also tell you that you know how to write a neutrino master. It will also allow you to mix, have, having mixing between neutrinos. And who forces that to think beyond is neutrino oscillation. So this is my number five, five take home message. 
that neutrino oscillation is the first exclusive evidence for physics beyond the standard model. I take a one minute break. I would like to take because I have half an hour more. So if there is any question. Yeah. Be loud. Be loud. Yeah. To neutrino detects are detecting neutrinos, but indirect way. So indirect way yeah. means detecting electrons and beyond right, right, sure. like that. So as you said, the range of energy of neutrinos is huge. Of ten to the uh, twenty-three orders. Yeah. So why the particular detector is detecting only a range of uh, uh, energy? Yes. Sir. Good question. So, <laughs> in principle. Suppose if I have a water detector here, very good question. So in water, you have electron, photon, neutron. And when a new is coming, it can be of any energy range. It should have some probability to interact with electron. So this is not that you know only at some little range of energies will interact with that electron. In principle, in any energy of electron neutrino can interact with the electron and give you fi you know final state products but then just think about you detector is needs to be optimized suppose you are planning a detector to see solar neutrinos or reactor neutrinos you know that their energies are not beyond mev so then you will look for a particular process in your detector so that all the final state particles should be inside the detector. Suppose, so I don't have a board, but if, so suppose if you have an electron neutrino with one TeV energy, it will come and hit an electron, then the outgoing electron will also have a very high energy, and it will not be confined in your detector, so it will just be created and will go out of the detector. So then how will you measure the properties or four momenta of that final state particle? Right? Because it is not your job is over that you say, I have seen a neutrino. You need to tell what was the energy of the neutrino, what was the distance it has traversed, because that will govern your oscillation. Right? Now, you don't measure the neutrino energy directly. You measure the four momenta of final state particles. Then you know that energy momentum is conserved. From that, you know you infer that what was the energy of the incoming neutrino. So now, suppose if you plan a detector which is sensitive for MeV neutrinos, then those MeV electrons which are coming out, they will be contained inside the detector. So it is good for MeV neutrinos. But a TeV, high energy neutrinos will also interact there. But the byproduct will just go out of the detector. So it is called partially contained events. So your information are, Less because of the bar. Okay? It is not depositing energy in your detector. Okay? So whenever you have a detector, in principle, it is sensitive to any range. Any range. There is a probability. Because if you if you remember, okay, if you remember, let me go back to this initial side, my plus uh, uh, this cross section. There is always a cross section, means probability, whatever is the energy. But sometime it is low, sometime it is high. Okay? Now, think about at these energies, tumara chota detector hune se, particle to bahar nikal jayega. So you need ice cube, the one kilometer cube detector in ice, because if you want to detect these neutrinos, you see ice cube. So you need such a big detector, which is one kilometer cube, so that if a neutrino is coming and creating a charged particle, you can really track that particle inside your detector. But if you have just a 50 kiloton water tank, aayega chala jaye. So in principle, it is sensitive, but it is not optimized. So for each energy range, you have different color class of experiment, different class of detectors, okay, to get the best out of those neutrino events. Am I clear? 
And another, there was another question. Yes. So in one of your slides, you made a claim that said that um, neutrinos don't interact with interstellar magnetic fields. Yeah. But isn't there a case where um, the neutrino in, an ex in a uniform external magnetic field can couple directly to the electromagnetic field through its dipole magnetic moment? Yeah, so for that, you know, first of all, neutrinos are massless. Through oscillation, it has a very tiny mass. And also, it is a neutral particle. So people have talked about this, you know, very rare electromagnetic properties of neutrinos, electro, uh, neutrino dipole moment. But that has to be proportional to its some mass or mass square. So it is so super tiny, OK, that, you know, it is very difficult to plan an experiment and detect, OK? But these rare processes people are thinking of, OK? okay. Just like you have electron, like, you know, neutron dipo dipole moment. Yeah. Okay, it is also neut uh, neutral, OK? So it is difficult to detect, like, unlike electron dipole moment, yeah. OK? Any other question? I mean, in, you yeah. also said that in the uh, detector, uh, the way you're differentiating between solar neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos is the direction, right? Yes. And you said atmosphere is everywhere. Yeah. But, like, so is light, isn't huh? it? So See, is. Yeah, so it is coming from all possible direction. Yeah. But I told you, in, if you see just now your detector, it is not that you, the number of events are large. Okay. It is very rare. I told you in Super K, every day in 24 hours, you are having in, from atmosphere hardly two or three events. So it is not like, you know, if it is coming from here, at a time in your detector, at most there can be one or two events. It is not that it is not that it is but sometime you can see neutrino from this direction, sometime from this direction. So it is not like always the f detector is full of light. Because events are very rare, no? Is that clear? May I move? OK. Huh. Uh, I was wondering, huh. because you're talking about the of water. Right, right. And uh, I just got uh, Approved. complete funding. Yeah, complete which funding. Is, which is very good for the neutrino Seven uh, times than the super K detector. It's beautiful. And we were having that discussion in right, that meeting. Right, right. So I think it will be of some use if we can uh, let students know what exactly observational consequences are we looking at if we have hyper K. Yeah. So good, very good question. So suppose if I just think about this massive detector, hyper Kamiokande, which is like 180 kiloton fiducial. Think about super K. It is 22.5 kiloton fiducial. And now they are aiming for a detector 180 kiloton. Eight times ho gaya na? Afli, haan, eight times. So art guna bada ho, jo detector hoga, what we can achieve from that? So first of all, your number of rates will be eight times, because eight you have eight times bigger detector. So you can see solar neutrinos. And now not only oscillation, you can study the properties of sun. You can see more atmospheric neutrinos. So you can tell about your atmosphere. What is the composition of cosmic ray? Because number of events will be very large. Then you can see also geoneutrinos. But the most important use of that detector is this T2HK, Tokai to Hyper Kamiokande experiment, the beam that they are planning to send in 2027 from J Park. And if they can send that beam to this big detector, they will send sometime neutrino beam sometime anti-neutrino beam. And by seeing the events in their detector, they can tell us whether CP, the charge parity, is violated or not in neutrino oscillation, which is I am going to discuss. So the holy grail of the hyper Kamiokande detector is to see those beam neutrinos and anti-neutrinos separately in time, and to tell you whether you have leptonic CP violation or not. Why that is important? Because we know at the beginning of the universe, there was equal amount of matter and antimatter. But now, we have only matter. Good. Otherwise, we will annihilate and vanish. So who created that matter-antimatter asymmetry? At the beginning, everything was there. So we don't know exactly the reason. What is the reason behind this matter-antimatter asymmetry? But we know we have some theory 
One of the popular theories is leptogenesis, and it demands CP violation in neutrino oscillation. In a nutshell, when neutrino oscillate and when anti neutrino oscillate, they oscillate different way. Flavor change, yes. Their rate of flavor change is different due to a very interesting Dirac phase in the theory I will talk about. So, yeah. Opera experiment looked for new tau. They had a new mu beam, and they first time detected tau neutrino in their detector by the appearance of tau. So they had seven tau events in Grand Sasso. Okay? But in the opera experiment, there was a claim that the neutrino moves faster than light, but later on they found that was a bug in their estimate. So everything is fine, okay? There is no tachyons. <laughs> huh? Ah, okay. So, no, uh, I have to move. Ah, bolo. So, uh, what is the speed of a neutrino? Huh? What is the speed of a neutrino? That's a good question. I leave it to you. Okay, suppose I give a mass. Suppose take a neutrino mass is 0.2 electron volt. Okay? Yeah. And suppose, okay, and uh, you are asking what is the? Mass, or, yeah, speed of a neutrino. Speed of neutrino. And suppose you have a 1 GV neutrino with a mass of 0.2 electron volt. Why don't you calculate the V? Okay. You do it yourself, and then we can. So you, I can tell you, if you get the number, the speed will be very close to the speed of light. Because we, your, our mass is very tiny, tiny, tiny. That means you are almost massless, like photon. Then you have, have a speed close to the speed of light. So uh, if uh, a neutrino moves uh, about to the speed of light, then according to special theory of relativity, it yes. uh, must have more mass than we have observed. Because more mass uh, means? So if it is really massless, yeah. then the speed should be exactly equal to the velocity of light. But if it is massive, then it will move slow. So it will, its velocity will be close to light, but less. Okay. And uh, sir, do you have uh, detected uh, right-hand neutrinos? Right-handed neutrinos? Yeah. No. So the experiment, in the experiment, Goldhaber's experiment, we have seen that parity is maximally violated. So all the neutrinos are left-handed, yeah. and all the anti-neutrinos are right-handed. So okay. right-handed neutrinos are just hypothetical particles. Yes, right-handed right -handed, yeah, right -handed neutrinos are hypothetical, but they are very important for, to give neutrino mass. And we can call them sterile neutrinos, because we have not seen them. OK, let me uh, co continue, because I have ha uh, a story to tell you, which is the oscillation. So OK, I can take like 15 minutes, if 20 minutes I have. So OK, so, so I covered this much. So now we understood something, OK? Let me begin again. So let's talk about sun, because how this story of neutrino oscillation unfolded. So around 1960s or 70s, there were two important problems we faced, rather anomalies. One was solar neutrino anomaly, and another was atmospheric neutrino anomaly. So let me just talk about those anomalies. So when we think about solar neutrinos, so this is the thermonuclear fusion process. OK? 98% is the light, photons with this energy, 2% are neutrinos, but that is enough for us. This is the amount of neutrinos at the Earth. Just very few numbers to remember. Neutrinos are needed if I don't write those neutrinos in the final state. Energy momentum, angular momentum will not be conserved, right? Very beginning, the Pauli's postulate. Hmm? So neutrinos are essential for the sun to shine and for our existence. So without neutrinos, we will not survive. So this is number six take home message. Huh? Why should we care about neutrinos? You can tell your parents, we will not survive that. So this is the Nobel Prize in 2002. It is astronomy school. So this gentleman, Raymond Davis Jr., he played an important role to detect the solar neutrinos in chlorine experiment. And Koshiba san to detect the supernova neutrinos in 1987, Nobel Prize, they were given in 2002. And to me, that was indeed 
the era of Newtonian astronomy started. Okay? Just like gravitational wave astronomy started few years back, 2002, I must, you know, this is an important year in the milestone of neutrino physics. That era of neutrino astronomy started, we had the confidence that indeed we can observe those cosmic neutrinos making Pauli wrong. Okay? Good. Do we really understand how the sun shines? We see light from the sun. We can calculate then how many neutrinos we expect from sun. Because they are coming from the same process. Professor Bethe, Professor Bakal, they had given us standard solar model and it gives you accurate prediction of how many neutrinos you expect now from sun. Okay? People started experiments because they had the confidence ki, we have been able to detect. So let's plan experiments. But, you know, you plan something, but nature has something in his mind or her mind. So these are the different type of experiments, okay, I am talking about. I'm sorry for this, you know, vague picture. The quality is not good. So this is Super K, this is Cameo Khande, this is Galax, different types of solar neutrino experiment. These yellow bands are telling you how many neutrinos you expect from your theory. And these blue bands are telling you how much you have seen in experiment. So you can see that the data is always less than theory. And all these experiments are only sensitive to electron type. They are not sensitive to muon or tau. So you know, you know ki, okay, if I wait for 100 years, 10 years, I expect 100 solar neutrinos. But sometimes some experimenters are seeing 30, sometimes 40, sometimes 50. Why they are different? Because they are seeing all solar neutrinos, the distance is same, but they are sensitive to different energies of the solar neutrinos. You know that solar neutrino has a range of energy from few MeVs to 10, 10, of, 10 MeV, so less than MeV to 10 of MeV. There is a spectrum of solar neutrino. So people ask the question from this data that only about 30 to 50 percent neutrinos we have found. What happened to the rest of the neutrinos? Different experiments gave different neutrino loss because they are looking at different energies. Super Kamiokande also they saw some depletion. I just forgot to discuss. So this was Super Kamiokande. You see, this is 40% flat. Good. So then people came up with the reason, oh, OK, astrophysicist doesn't know anything. They have, must have done some you know, miscalculation. Or you guys don't know how to detect them, experimentalist. They don't, can't measure accurately. Or, you know, neutrinos behave differently from what you have thought of. So there are three possible solutions. So let's leave for the next five minutes with this anomaly. In the backdrop, there was another anomaly was there in the picture, which was atmospheric neutrino anomaly. So you know how atmospheric neutrinos are created. I explained from pi on decay. Then you have a muon. Then you have a decay of muon, which is called Michel electron. So you can see you have two muon type neutrino and one electron type neutrino, isn't it? Just see this chain. If you have a pion, then pion gives you muon, muon again decay. So in this chain, you have two muon type neutrino, one electron type neutrino. This is the smoking gun feature of atmospheric neutrino flux. Do muon type hoga, ek electron type hoga. So muon is to electron ratio should be 2 is to 1. If nothing fishy is happening. Clear? And since atmosphere everywhere, the flux that you see from up and down should be same. So this is our understanding of atmospheric neutrinos. OK, fine. Yeah. Yes. Particle and is antiparticle. So in water, 
a new mu will give you mu minus and a new mu bar. So I need, uh, uh, so think about your super k. Uh, and the neutrinos are coming. So if you have a new mu, it interacts with a neutron, gives you proton plus mu minus, and a new mu bar gives you, hits a proton, gives you neutron plus mu plus. So you get mu minus for new mu, new mu bar, mu plus. But in water, you don't distinguish between mu minus and mu plus. But in our India-based Newton Observatory, we have detector like iron. So you can put magnetic field in the iron, ferromagnetism. And this is the most unique feature of India-based Newton Observatory detector, which this feature is not there in any other detector in the world, that you can see atmospheric muon neutrino and anti neutrino separately in your detector, but not like in super Kamiokande. But so they will see total two muon type neutrino, but if you have a new E, then you will see one electron. So the ratio of muon type event over electron type event is two is to one. Okay, fine, let me proceed. So India was the first to detect atmospheric neutrinos in the Karnataka Kohler Goldfield experiment. This detector was planned to see photon decay, but we landed up seeing atmospheric neutrinos. Okay, so this was the PR physics letters paper. And just after a few weeks, there was another group from Johannesburg in South Africa. They also claimed they have seen atmospheric neutrinos, but we are the first. And this was the TIFR, Darham and Osaka group in Japan. Darham in UK, TIFR, collaboration. Okay, they first time detected atmospheric neutrinos, okay, in Kohler Goldfield. So this is the super Kamiokande anomaly. If you see all the atmospheric neutrino experiment, this is the called double ratio. Double ratio means number of muon events over electron events from your data in your experiment. And what is your theory? Theory should be 2 is to 1. Then data should be also 2 is to 1. So the ratio should be 1. This is called double ratio. But when they did the experiment, they saw equal number of muon event and electron event. So the numerator was 1 and denominator was 2. So roughly you see all these data points from various experiments are hanging around 0.5. So the anomaly was 50% of new mu or new mu bar, they are oscillating to something else. You have measured same amount of new E, but half of the new mu's have lost. So the ratio that they have seen is not 2 is to 1, it is 1 is to 1. And that was the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. Clear? So we live with two anomalies. Another thing that Super Kamiokande saw, that electron neutrinos, there is no anomaly. I told you. High energy new mu from above, jo neutrinos upar se aare hai, they have only distance 10 meter, 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer. So the length is so small, they will not oscillate. But the neutrinos, which are passing through Earth, they have a long distance to travel, more oscillation. And most of the neutrinos which were coming from the down, they were lost. That is another interesting observation. So you see, in x-axis, this is the zenith, means the direction of the neutrino. So here you see that when you have a multi-GV neutrino, when cos theta is less than one, means upward going, and you see your data is half of the theory. Theory is red line, data is these black points. But when it is coming from the top, then also it is close to the theory because when cos theta is in the range 0 to 1, means it is coming from top. And this is close to theory, but still there is some oscillation. For electron, data theory is matching. So this is what super Kamiokande. 
good to good to know so then the explanation of these two anomalies came via neutrino oscillation so professor punto corvo in 1957 gave this idea of neutrino oscillation so neutrino oscillation is a very simple quantum mechanical interference phenomena like your double slit experiment we have all done in our college days right young's double slit experiment so neutrino oscillation means they are behaving like a chameleon particles when they travel they change their flavor and it happens if neutrinos have mass non degenerate mass and they should mix among each other and i should go a little bit more into the theory so when you produce a neutrino or a detect a neutrino you say neutrino flavor new e new mu new tau but when they travel from you to me they not travel in the flavor basis they travel in the mass basis and this mass basis and flavor basis is connected by a two cross two unitary mixing matrix in this way so new one and new two are the two mass bases with fixed mass eigenvalues they are the mass eigenstates of evolution and these are your flavor eigenstates and it is connected by a two cross two matrix okay so you can think like the superposition principle in quantum mechanics that a flavor eigenstate which i call new e new mu or new tau it is a linear superposition of mass eigenstates new one and new two with some component okay so that was the idea of ponte gorvo so when neutrinos travel they travel in the mass basis there is no identity of new and new mu whenever you detect they boils down to flavor basis and you say okay i have detected a new e i have detected a new mu you never say that i have detected a new one or i have detected a new two okay so they propagate in mass basis and this is the effective hamiltonian of those neutrino mass evolution and you can see that the mass of the neutrino is very small compared to the momentum or energy so you can do this binomial expansion and you can see that interference can only happen if all the neutrinos have same momenta that means you can think like in the neutrino beam they are all having coherence maintained and then you can write down the schrodinger equation i ddt of psi is h psi and now if you consider the time evolution you can see that this hamiltonian is coming there but this hamiltonian has the momentum same for all the mass bases but they only differ in mass because mass eigenstate has eigen values m1 and m2 <coughs> so this piece is different but this piece is same for both mass eigenstates so if i go with this equation proceed i start with the initial flavor alpha after the time t this is my flavor composition now i ask what is the probability that if i start with a flavor alpha it will be in the same flavor alpha and this is given by a simple formula one mixing angle is coming so it is a product of two sine square function sine square x times sine square y x is the mixing angle this is a fundamental parameter in your theory like electron mass and this is the mass square difference <coughs> remember when neutrino travels they travel in the mass basis with the mass eigen values m2 and m1 and this is the mass square difference so these are the two fundamental parameters when i talk about neutrino oscillation one is the mixing angle another is the mass square difference you know the l you know the energy you plug in there this is the oscillation probability and one minus this is the survival probability okay so with this formula one can explain the super kamiokande result when your baseline is small there is no oscillation 100% new mu remains 100% new mu when you increase the distance means when neutrinos are coming from the down this new mu is going 50% in new x 
And at some point, there's a 100% conversion. So when you see these distances, like the neutrinos coming from the down, you see in average 50% oscillation. You see? So on an average, there is a 50% oscillation. And this was indeed happened. Half of the new mu, which were coming through Earth, they oscillated to something else, which was new tau. And your detector was only sensitive to new mu. So they saw half. So with this simple oscillation formula, you can explain Newton oscillation. That's why Professor Kajita san was given the Nobel Prize. With the same phenomena, I don't have time now, you can explain the neutrino flavor change in the sun. I have to skip it, but believe me, for this reason, this Nobel Prize was shared by Professor McDonald because he planned an experiment called Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. This detector has a unique role to play. It was sensitive to all the flavors. So if they are oscillating to different flavors, and if you can measure all the flavors, then the sum should be one. And that was the beauty of Sudbury Neutrino Ex Observatory experiment, ki jayega to kaha jayega. Let them oscillate to different flavors. I am sensitive to all the flavors, and the sum should be one. The number of neutrinos you started with, you should get back those. And that's why he proved that neutrino flavor change is the mechanism happening for solar neutrino anomaly. And Professor Kajita san explained that neutrino flavor change is the responsible for atmospheric neutrino anomaly. They got the Nobel Prizes. Now what is rest? Life is end. Do you have any question to answer? In last few minutes, important open question for you guys, for me as well. So from oscillation data, I told you that there are now three neutrinos. So there are three mass eigenstates, nu1, nu2, nu3. With, with mass eigenvalues m1, m2, m3. Data tells us that m2 is heavier than m1 from solar data. And also we know what is the gap between m2 and m3. But present data doesn't allow you to discriminate whether m3 is heavier than m2 or m3 is lower than m2. So this third mass eigenstate can be heavier than 1 and 2. This is called normal hierarchy. And this can be also lower than 2 and 1. This is called inverted hierarchy. This is the famous hierarchy problem in neutrino oscillation. And our India-based neutrino observatory is going to address this physics okay, by observing atmospheric neutrinos. Another thing, this atmospheric mixing angle I just talked about, theta 2, 3, super K is measuring its value is around 45 degree, but it can be below 45 or above 45. So this is called the octant of 2, 3 mixing angle. We don't know this. But why do we care about this? I told you that we need a new standard model to explain neutrino mass. And when you build a new model, you need to know what is the exact value of theta 2, 3. So for model building, you need this question to be answered. And the last question, whether CP is violated in neutrino oscillation, means whether neutrino and antineutrino oscillations are different or same. That means if they are different, then neutrino probability minus antineutrino probability should be finite. And it should be proportional to this JCP where you have this phase. So if this phase is 0, then you have CP conservation. And if it is pi by 2, then sine pi by 2 is 1. You have maximal CP violation. So this is the three important questions. And just, I am concluding, this is the present situation about the neutrino oscillation parameters. So let me remind you, I am leaving you with this, that we need to know mass hierarchy. That means the third mass eigenstate, it is above M2 or below M2. CP is violated or not. And what is the value of theta 2, 3? The mixing angle, atmospheric mixing angle. These are the open questions. This is our India-based neutrino observatory. We have more than 100 scientists. 
This is one collaboration picture from Madurai, but we had last year in TI for another collaboration meeting. So the plan is that we go to south in Bodhi West Hills, in Theni district and Pottipuram village. These are the coordinates. And we should build a big underground lab there and also some ex uh, institution to maintain the lab facilities. And there we want to build a massive 50 kiloton magnetized iron calorimeter detector. So you have slab of irons, and in between two iron slab, like sandwiches, you have active detector. So when a neutrino will come, atmospheric neutrino, it will interact in the iron, give you those muons, and those muons will pass through and give you a long track. And if it is magnetized, mu minus will bend this way, mu plus will bend this way. So this is, so this is the India-based neutrino observatory. You have magnetic field there. This is the multi-layer physics goals. But remember, the USP of INO is we will be able to answer mass hierarchy problem. That means the third mass eigenstate, it is upper hai ya niche hai. Okay? This is a very fundamental question that we will be able to address. I don't have time, but we have now a 85 ton mini ICAL. It is running from 2018 May in a transit campus in Madurai. And now, a few months back, we have got the permission to build a new institute called Inter-Institutional Center for High Energy Physics in Madurai, where we will have more than 50 faculty members to just maintain this lab activity, because the underground lab will be in Theni, which is a little bit far from Madurai, 100 kilometer. So this center, so now we are working to build a, another bigger module because you can't build a 50 kiloton magnetized detector in one shot. You have to build prototypes, get confidence. Because it's a huge 50 kiloton magnet. So next goal is from 85 ton, which is now starting, already started, we'll build a 700 ton engineering module in that campus and in that institute only, okay? to see whether our concept works or not. So this is the some activity. It is not that we are just only talking in pen and paper. For last 15 years, 100 people were working day and night in several institutes and universities to come up with various components of the detector. It's a mammoth detector. And you can see just like these are the magnet coils. Just I'm telling you, these are the activities we did for this mini ICAL, and you can see this is the mini ICAL, now looks like, and this is the bending of the cosmic muons. With small detector, you can't see neutrinos, but you have cosmic muons, and you can see mu plus and mu minus are bending in different directions, so these are live data. So if you go to this website, IICHEF website, this data is accessible to you guys. And you can see this bending, OK? Good. Many students are involved. In INO, we have our own graduate training program. We give our own fellowship. And we have trained more than 30 PhD students. They are all doing postdoc in abroad or in India now. And few of them have already got faculty positions, OK? This is the graduate training program of India-based Newton Observatory, unique in the world. None other experiment has their own training program. But since in India, we didn't have the tradition of doing experiments, it was important to run its own school, OK, to build the manpower. We are also working with other countries. This was the MOU signed in 2018 with US and INO collaboration to exchange the leadership and to exchange the ideas of research. This is the physics white paper. We address the question, what kind of physics we can do with this detector in this white paper? And our group in Bhuvaneshwar has played a very important role. I don't have time to address this, so let me conclude. So I was talking about last one and a half years, uh, hours. OK, for India-based neutrino observatory, my journey started in 2004 when I was a graduate student. 
okay, now 2020, but I'm still dreaming that it will come. It has to come for our high energy physics community. We need to know how to do experiments. We need to know without fighting how 100 people can work together. Okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this environment needs to be created. And now we are fortunate, not only we have INO, but we have the super LIGO also. So there are other high energy projects coming up in the country. So I must tell you that we are in a very exciting era in India. Don't think about abroad, but you know, just think about your own country. There are projects happening near you. We need to just open your eyes, come more to the science center. They will tell you what is happening. And you know, it is an age of social media. Just, just connect, explore your dreams. Big, think big. So I told you that oscillation is one of the important thing in neutrino physics, which is making so much of fuss. But indeed, there is something special. It is telling you something which theory contradicts. Theory tells no neutrino mass. Experiment tells neutrinos are massive. Then so, you need new standard model. This is the dream of all particle physicists. Okay? So neutrinos have opened a new window beyond the standard model. This was my title of the talk. And I hope that I could inject what I was trying to tell in your mind. And if you have any questions, just connect us in our social media page or drop an email to me. You will be answered. Always, definitely you will be answered later or sooner. Okay? So neutrino physics has entered into the precision era. Oscillations have been established. Now we need to measure the oscillation parameters. Because you have a nice oscillation model and it has new parameters. And our job is to make new experiments and measure those parameters. And INO can play an important role and you guys can play an important role. Thank you.